in tonight's talk, there are a couple of ideas that I think are very important. And I'd like to start with a couple of ahadith that I think really um, set the stage for our discussion tonight. First and foremost, you may know and uh, have heard many times the discussion um, about why it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us here on earth. You may have heard other scholars and other, uh, in other discussions this being brought forth. And can someone tell me what is the answer to that question? Why are we here on earth? Yes. And what is the ayah? Yes. Thank you. MashaAllah. Beautiful. Wonderful. Sisters get a point. <laughs> um, exactly. Exactly. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have not created mankind nor the jinn other than to worship. And to, meaning to worship him, Jalla Jalla. And I think this is a really important ayah because it's, here we set the stage. And as the sisters who've heard me discuss before, I love to discuss this ayah. When people say, and that very famous question of why are we here on earth? What are humans doing here on earth? And that's the million dollar question, right, that everyone seems to be wanting to figure out the answer to. For us as Muslims, it's very simple. It's clear in the ayah. And everything boils down to that ayah, right? That really, there's no other purpose on being here on earth other than to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if that truly is the starting point that we begin our discussion, well then anything dealing with parenting goes right back to that point. That if the point of us being here is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then by default, the point of having children and parenting them and raising them is also to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning our entire focus in parenting should be none other than to raise children, thank you, who will be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the more tricky part is how, the how, the how you do that. And that is inshallah part of our discussion. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on in a different part of actually answering that, the how. And can anyone think of an ayah that answers the how? Anything? The sisters are contemplating here. MashaAllah. We have some go-getters in the front. MashaAllah. <laughs> how about, how about, I'll start it for you. Inni ja'ilun. Uh-huh. MashaAllah. That's two points. Same sister. MashaAllah. <laughs> MashaAllah. <laughs> exactly. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have placed on earth a khalifa. And what does he mean? What does the term khalifa translate as? Sorry? MashaAllah. Beautiful. MashaAllah. MashaAllah, representatives on earth, a khalifa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the how, meaning that if you want to then be worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the how is becoming a khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? His representative. In order to be his representative, then we have to then be able to follow all the rules of the sharia that he brought down, right? Because that is how you represent him, Jalla Jalala, right? So all of our actions then, and everything we aspire to goes back to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being his khalifa on earth. So with that, it informs our entire discussion. It informs everything from, you know, choosing a spouse, who it is you marry. Because that will inform parenting. We don't begin the discussion once the child is here. We begin the discussion all the way back here with who do we choose as a spouse in the first place, right? And then the discussion goes further after that of, thinking and really contemplating and timing when it is we bring children into this world, inshallah, with the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that, and in that, there's a lot of discussion well as well, but we don't have enough time to go through all, all of the details. In fact, this, I should say, by opening remarks, are actually an introduction to a much longer course that I teach that's called spiritual parent, uh, spiritual child raising, or spiritual parenting. And in that discussion, we talk about the choosing the spouse. We talk about 
the when, the when and how of having children. We talk about the woman's pregnancy and what she should be doing during the course of pregnancy to really prepare herself for having, giving birth to this Khalifa, right? Um, we talk about labor, pregnancy, labor, right? delivery. We go through all of these stages before the child is even born. Because a woman and a man, a man and woman, husband and wife that do that, that have that concept from the very beginning, are really the couple who are able to then truly parent according to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained for us to, inshallah. Now for all of us who already have children and are in the room going, oh dear, I miss those stages, <laughs> inshallah. Not to worry. You can always have more, inshallah. Um, try again. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Although you're welcome to, and that's another, that's another, yet another hadith that the Prophet and very famous that he talks about, where he says and talks about his own ummah as being plentiful, right? As saying, he's going to be some, he, on the day of judgment, he's going to be um, so proud, right, of his ummah because of their numbers. But then at the same time, there is the other hadith that balances that hadith out in terms of quantity, the other hadith that talks about quality, right? And that hadith is when he was sitting with the companions, and he says, and he thought, he, was, he kind of foreshadowed what's to come, and he said to the companions that there will come a time where you'll be many. You'll be many. Right? Does anyone know this hadith? But what? But what? Yes, exactly. MashaAllah. Both, both sides won. MashaAllah. <laughs> Exactly. I heard foam, I heard ineffective, I heard... So you have quantity, but the quality is problematic because there's so many of us. But it's like, and he describes this as being like the foam, right, that's on the ocean, right, when the waves come forward, the crest of the wave, right, that come forward, that foam that comes, that's really nothing. You can just blow it away. It really has no substance to it. And so he says... And in that hadith, we understand the importance of quality over quantity, right? And so they say, why, Ya Rasulullah, why will we be weak, even though we're many? And he says, because you'll be like foam, right? So anyhow, going back to our discussion here, these two hadith also inform this whole idea of khalifa. So we quality, uh, quantity, yes, but quality is more important. And here we talk about what it is and how it is we get we get to really make sure that we're parenting properly from the very beginning. So let's talk about stages. So I'll just kind of lay the ground in shallow for stages before I hand it over to Hiba. Um, let's talk about the four very important concepts. You find these concepts in the books of the Sawuf, the books that are talking about the spiritual upbringing of a human being. Imam al-Ghazali very uh, famously discusses these four aspects. And inshallah, I'd like to focus and give you just a couple of um, uh, points on each of them. The first is fitra. And what does fitra mean? How do we translate fitra? I, hear, I see, I see <laughs> lips. Yes? Uh -huh. Natural tendencies. What else? Basic. Nature, basic nature. Okay, mashallah. All good. Fitra is actually a very difficult word to translate. And interestingly enough, when you look it up in Arabic dictionaries, like when you look it up in Lisan al Arab, which is the most famous Arabic dictionary for Arabic words, right? for fitra, it actually just says, Yani fitra. Meaning, <laughs> it is so basic that they don't even attempt to translate it. Mashallah. So anyhow, back to what it means. There's so many words we can use to describe fitra in translating it. But you get the point when we say your basic tendencies, uh, your nature, right? What's inherent to you, etc. So this idea of fitra, an Islamic explanation, right, is that the child, and Allah teaches us that all of us are born on the fitra. And that fitra is something that is already we, we are inclined, and that's a good word, inclined to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that children, how they were already born from the very beginning, is a longing and a, an a understanding that there is actually something greater than them. This is the fitra that every child is born on. So then comes in the other famous hadith that you all know, inshallah, right? Where we say, every child is born on the fitra. 
And then what? What's the continuation of that hadith? Right? Exactly. Then his, so every child is starting again, every child is born on the fitrah until his parents, basically, his parents either make them a Christian, a Jew, or Majus, which were the fire worshippers, right? So meaning that they're over, all, every child is born on that fitra state. But at some point, the parents begin to inoculate the child with whatever it is they believe in. So the child takes on those tendencies. Either it keeps them on the fitra, which is the deen of Islam in our belief, or it moves them away from the fitra. In this case here, uh, there comes another hadith that explains when this happens, because many people wonder, when does this start to happen? So the Prophet ﷺ says this process of going away from the fitra starts to happen around the age of two. And the explanation for that, or actually I should say what the actual hadith is, he goes, um, is, uh, حَتَّى يُعْرَبْ عَنْهُ لِسَانُ until, until the child is able to start talking. And the reason, that's uh, roughly around two, roughly, and the reason for that, the reason for the explanation of that hadith is what we call in our field of psychology and psychiatry is the socialization factor. Once this the child starts to become socialized, meaning you're able to speak to them and they're able to respond back to you. See, when that starts to happen a year and a half or two years, the child is now able to learn and take from whatever, whoever is inculcating them, whoever is teaching them, and move away from the fitra state, potentially, or stay on the fitra state. So here we realize, wow, that means it's really early on. We look at a little year and a half child or a two-year-old child and we think, ah, they're just a little kid, big deal. No, subhanAllah, this is the stage it starts from very early on, right? And definitely by that age. That if we're not kind of keeping them on the straight fitra all the way through, they have the potential to start moving away from it. And then you say to yourself, and you may be saying to yourself, what's happening at two? What can possibly go wrong at two? SubhanAllah. Well, that's what the longer course is for, <laughs> the longer discussion that we have, where I break down every single stage and every single age and talk about the, um, the, uh, what, basically how to help them, but also the fears and the harms that may come in each and every stage. And so see here, you, you realize then the fitra becomes a very important thing that we have to talk about. And to re remind us all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took an oath, right? That we took an oath to believe in him. And what am I talking about? What am I talking about here? And at what point did we all take this oath? Yes, right. Before we were even born before we were even on earth, right? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us before we were actually here, we were up, right? Our, meaning our, like you, you're translated as our spirits, right? We were actually created and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, said to us what? What is it? Am I not, he asked, am I not your Lord? And all of us responded and said, Bana, right? Yes, you are. So we took an oath to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, that again, with that fitra state, we all have it, and we've all taken that oath. So here is the whole discussion of continuing on that fitra state as best as possible, inshallah. So that is the concept of fitra. The second one I want to introduce is the concept called in Arabic, dhok. Dhok. Dhok, if you do a rough translation, is to taste something, right? <coughs> taste. Here we're talking about experiential tasting of what? Of Though of actually having this experience of connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they talk about the many experiences of, uh, and a good translation would be to the wonder, right, the wonderment a child may have in longing for this bigger creator. Meaning what? Think about, put your mind, put, think about if you've had a child yourself or if you know or work with children, think about that age group between three, four, five, right? What is What is the most... Um, characteristic part of this age group? Yes, questions. Someone said they're so curious. Everything. They're so curious. What's this and why is that? I have a, a child, one of my children is in this age group right now. And every day he asks me, every day, something or the other, and says, Mama, where did these chicken nuggets come from? 
And so we go through the whole story. It came from the chicken, right? <laughs> and he takes it all the way back. And, he, and then he has to recount the whole story to me. He says, Allah created the chickens. Then the chickens were on the farm. Then we slaughtered the chickens. Then we cut up the chicken. Then we put the breading. Then we put, made the chicken nuggets. Then we packed it in the then they packed it in the boxes. They shipped it to the store and we bought it. He has to go through every single step. And they're so curious. They have to know exactly what's going on. And they ask you all the time, and they catch you by surprise with all these different questions. Uh, all kinds of curiosity, right, is what this stage is very, uh, what they're very, uh, it's very characteristic of the stage. They're just filled with wonderment. And here, Imam Ghazali would say, this concept is called thilq. Being able to instill this in a child is very important. Because then you're able to have the type of child that when they do experience something like, ah, oh, the light bulb goes off, that's where the chicken nuggets came from, right? They're able then to tie it back to the Creator. So at that young, they can actually learn, subhanAllah, they can learn the term, subhanAllah, right? Wow, right? Instead of just wow, right? But they can learn that this goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's keeping them on the fitra state. Right? We tie it back, this beautiful rainbow, the clouds, the sky, the sea, the, the little birdie, you know, the little ant that's in the backyard. Right, Every little thing, it ties back to, and when you as an adult go, subhanAllah, and get down to their level, and yes, get down to their level, right? then it, it instills and inculcates in them what? The concept of subhanAllah, and you continue on to the fitrah. And you, that, that way, it's not as adults we go back and try to learn all the concepts of tasawwuf. We have it from the very beginning. We already had it as in the fitrah state, and it's just continuing on, inshallah, in the correct manner. So we talked about fitrah, we talked about dhok, then dhok is the next concept, and I'll do one more and then I'll hand it over to Hibba, inshallah. But dhok, here is the understanding, uh, this, this word is best translated as longing, having a longing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for our creator. And for the, crea for the creation having a longing for the creator. And here, this too, to have a child who actually longs, you see it more coming up in the further stages as we go along. And really, the best stage where you really see this, if you do all things right, inshallah, is the teenage stage. Yes, those pesky teenagers, subhanAllah. The scholars say that in that, by the way, that term adolescence is actually a made-up term. It was never there in history. You went from being a child to being an adult. <laughs> there was no such thing as teens and adolescents. This is a created concept. Right? <clears throat> Anyhow, that's another discussion for another time. But that age group has an amazing propensity for spirituality, for really connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll tell you something. Either they're going to throw themselves into something that is problematic, or they're going to throw themselves into something that's full of khayr and full of good. Let me, let me paint the picture a little bit more clearly here. Take a teenager. Let's talk about girls for a minute. I have a whole hundred. Any, any Friday you come to MCC, there's about a hundred girls running around <laughs> in our various halakas, right, that we're mentoring and teaching and so on, and mentoring those who then come back and mentor the girls who are younger than them, mashallah. But let me tell you about this, this starting from the age of about it's essentially 13, 14, 15 onwards. In this age group, there's such, such passion that happens in this age group that either that passion is channeled into boy craze, right? And all the talk is about music and boys and the, their question on this guy and the question on that guy and this actor and this kid in school and so on and so forth, right? And not that boys don't do this either. I'm just talking about girls for the moment. It's channeled all of this passion that goes into that discussion and it's funny us as the, the the mentors teaching them we're kind of like oh, every generation that we've mentored it's like oh no or you know way back when it was you know whatever how far back should we go backstreet boys or <laughs> whoever it was way back when and then it was you know the Bieber fe fever and the whoever and the whoever and on and on and on this one and Zayn Malik and all the rest right all these people and every single girl group that comes in they do the same thing over and over and over again there's something characteristic about this age group in terms of the passion they have. Turn that, take it and turn it a little bit, and give them something better. Because the thing is, with girls, and you have to know, with young people in general, boys or girls, that if they don't have another channel or another outlet, it's going to end up in a haram channel. 
There's just no there's just no two ways about it, right? So here, what is this channel? What Imam Al Hazadi talks about and our teachers talk about? They talk about this stage of spiritual awakening. This unmatched in any other stage. This is where if a, if a child really goes through this, you find them sitting in the masjid, doing their hifth of Quran day and night, day and night, day and night, day and night. Right? They channel it into hifth. And there's a couple of us, I have to say, that in this age group, that's what we were doing. You know, our life and our teen years were devoted into Quran. Now, that's not necessarily for everybody, but I just want to tell you, those type of youth, if it's they're properly trained from the beginning, they have such a love for Quran and such a, that's not so important, this Bieber guy, right? <laughs> there really is a key difference. I'm not saying she's not going to have crushes. She will. But it won't be that all of her passion and all of her energy is put into it. There's actually something much higher and loftier that she aspires to. And that takes a lot of mentoring, not just from parents, but also from spiritual mentors. Another discussion for another time too, inshallah. And I want to tell parents of teens that this is a natural spiritual time frame in their life, where this is it's natural. That if it's done properly, they'll naturally be inclined to all things khayr, inshallah. Right? But if not, they're going to do exactly what their peers do. So that's another discussion. I know teens tends to bring up a lot of discussion. But think about it. Think about a lot of our main scholars, for example, who are converts. Think about them. Name them. Sheikh Hamza, Yusuf, you know, Dr. Ahmad, you know, think about um, Sheikh Nuh Keller, all these different scholars that you've heard of and that you've read their books and that you, you really esteem, they're really held in high esteem in your eyes. Almost every single one of them converted when they were about 17, 18 is when they came to Islam. And they were searching in their teen years until they came to Islam, subhanAllah. So it's no accident that this is truly the age of true spiritual awakening for our youth. So, inshallah, this idea of tawbah is something that one day we'll revisit in more detail. And then lastly, the fourth concept is insha'ah. And insha'ah means developing now the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through ibadah and through mu'amala, through worship and through actual uh, our actions, our, in, our interactions with other people. And this is where it's important we bring in the topics of fiqh and aqidah and the rest because treatment of Allah's proper treatment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and proper treatment of others. So these four concepts really are the, I would say, the pillars of our discussion on parenting. And inshallah, um, like I said about the Khalil Center and our therapists who are undergoing principles of Islamic psychotherapy, these are some of the principles that they're being trained in, in addition to their professional training as therapists, the Islamic concepts that they're tying in in their therapy, inshallah. So with that, I will uh, hand over the mic to Sister Hiba, then Brother Javed. Then, like I said, we'll break for Aisha and come back for closing remarks, which I'll kind of pull everything back together again, our discussion for tonight, and open it up for Q&A. Sister Hiba? Thank you so much, Dr. Rania, for that um, wonderful segment um, and introduction. Um, so to get right into it, just for the sake of time, um, before we assume any role in our lives um, or take on any type of responsibility, um, we have to first um, think about what perception we have of that role. What pre-existing um, notions or perceptions do we have? Um, and so as parents, what is our preconceived notion of parenting? Can anybody help me in answering that question? It's hard. It's hard. Definitely. Um, anybody else? Our own parents are role models. Our own parents are our role models. Okay. Sorry? It requires a lot of patience. Okay. Um, how about from the brother's side? We hope it's not too much trial and error. We hope, yeah. We hope it's not too much trial and error, definitely. Um, so we are, we are taught that um, before we assume the role of parenting, that we come to the full realization that our children are not ours. We do not possess them, they are merely in our care, right? So we don't own them. We don't, and oftentimes as parents, we have this sense of ownership over our children, that they belong to us, right? How dare somebody insult them? 
or how dare somebody hurt them, or how dare somebody offend them, or say, how can my friend say that about my daughter, right? Or how could she come and talk to me and tell me that my daughter did such and such? And oftentimes we get offended because we have this strong sense of ownership over our children, right? We are deluded sometimes into thinking that they're ours, they belong to us, where essentially they come through us, but they do not belong to us, right? They are only in our care for a certain period of time, um, for a decreed period of time in which we equip them with the right tools and with the right knowledge, right? Um, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and physically, right? In order for them to be successful adults and to face this world and its darkness with resilience, right? So that they don't shatter um, at the first sign of any sort of distress um, until, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides that their, their time is up, right? Um, so with that perception, and alhamdulillah, we're able to always renew our perceptions. We're able, just like we're able to renew our intentions, um, and our commitments. So, alhamdulillah, tonight could be a night in which all of us collectively renew our perception of parenting, that I don't own my children, so therefore, I shouldn't invest so much emotion um, into, into them as opposed to investing a lot of effort, right, or exerting a lot of effort to fulfill my duty, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every time he talks about um, gifting, right, or whenever he talks about prophets, peace be upon them, and them having children, he speaks of it in the context of a gift, um, and a perfect example of that is in Surah Al-Shura, Ayah 49, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, يَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ إِنَاثًا وَيَهَبُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ الذُّكُورِ Right? So, Allah gifts whomever He wills with females and whomever He wills with males. And Allah and it's stated gifts, right? So, it's always used in the context of gift. That our children are a gift to us in order for us to care for them and it's sort of like a training ground, right, before they are old enough to go out and, can, and face the world on their own. So what are we commanded to do as parents? You know, what is our prime responsibility as leaders of our household or as parents? Support. So support our children. Um, any, any other ideas? Guidance, right? So guiding them upon this path that Dr. Rani was mentioning earlier, right? That we have to guide them on the correct path. Whenever we see them slipping or falling off or navigating off the path, we bring them back on. We help to bring them back on, right? Can we always guarantee that they will come back on? No. And that is part of this realization that we don't own them. So I'm merely doing my job, right? I'm doing my best to ensure that they stay on the path, but I cannot guarantee it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, um, O you who believe, save yourself and your family from the hellfire. Right? So save yourself and your family from the hellfire. What does that look like? How can we save our families from the hellfire? By instilling the seed of spirituality in our children from a very young age. Right? So ensuring that we do not lead them or, or by any means or any, any shape or form, that we don't inspire them in the wrong way. Right? That we're always trying to be a good example or a good model for them to follow in our path. Right? Because for many years, in the beginning formative years, you are their only example. You and the father or the guardians or the grandparents or whoever it is that are the caretakers of the children are the only examples for children, right? So if you're the only example, that is a lot of pressure, right? But at the same time, if you're aware of the responsibility and you're aware of what you're supposed to be doing, it makes it a little easier because you expect it, you understand it. So sending, sending one's child to a madrasa, Quran classes, Islamic school, right, weekend schools, is all wonderful, and it should be on the agenda, right, in addition to their academics. But at the same time, that may have worked for previous generations. But we must, it's a sobering 
wake up call that that technique or that strategy may no longer work with today's generations or the future generations, right? Um, there's many different forces out there, right? And there's, uh, you know, the increase in technology and friends, the struggle with friends, right? It's a huge struggle, right? Who should my child be friend, right? And so being very aware of these forces that are working against us at times as parents. Um, and then we cannot focus on instilling spirituality in our children if their very basic needs are not met. So if love, acceptance, and attention is not given to the children, how can we expect them to be spiritual or pray or fast, right? How can, how can that expectation even be there? And a lot of moms, you know, you hear a lot of moms say, but I'm constantly around my kids. I'm a housewife. And my kids see me all the time. So what do you mean I need to pay more attention to my child? I don't know how more I can do that. How, how can I possibly do that more than what I'm already doing? And it's not just being around your children that will make the difference. And a lot of research, I always write, like to incorporate non-Muslim perspectives to see what their standpoint is on the issue. And subhanAllah, every single time, it reaffirms what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us. And that is, you know, that all the research, you know, that I, I've come across and that I've read, it states that it's not the amount of time that you spend with your children. It really all goes back to the quality of time that you spend with them. So a lot of parents say, well, I work and my spouse works, right? And when we come home, we just want to eat dinner, do their homework, right? And then read them a quick, like, five-minute bedtime story and then put them in bed so that they can wake up the next day ready for school. But it's really, it, even if it's just half an hour of full undivided attention, no iPhones, no TVs, no cartoons, no shows, no interruptions from anyone or anything, and just giving them the space and the opportunity to connect with you as their parent and for them to share with you their frustrations, their struggles, right? You tell them about your day and you'll find that they are very ready and willing to share with you what happened in their day, right? Mm -hmm. And this is, this is a perfect opportunity to sort of, you know, share with them stories, share with them your experiences, and then allow them to share their stories and their experiences, right? And who their friends are, and you get a peek, a sneak peek into their world and what their world looks like, because it is very different than our adult world. Um, so ensuring that their basic needs are met is number one. And then you start building upon that, right? And you start teaching them different aspects of spirituality. Now, modeling spirituality as opposed to teaching it, right? Spirituality is not a subject that can merely just be taught in a classroom setting, right? Because many, many youth were taught in a formal way Right, were instructed in a formal way in classrooms, and yet they grow up, and you know, people in the community are shocked when they do certain things, you know. But they were in my Sunday school class, or they were in my Islamic school, right? Or, or I knew them from the community, right? This is my friend's son, or this is my friend's daughter. How could they do something like that? Because maybe spirituality was not modeled at home. It was only, it was only a drop off pick up thing, right? So I drop you off to class, you learn the lesson, you come back, and you should be spiritual, right? Automatically. You should be praying, you should be fasting, you should be doing all of these things. But yet, it's a difficult task for parents to take on, and so it's much easier to just send them to a school, to just send them to a class, as opposed to, um, you know, and a lot of times I, I say this to parents that, you know, it's not just about us providing terbiya to our, to our children, disciplining our children. Oftentimes our children are disciplining us, right? And because they keep us in check a lot of the time. We don't sometimes see ourselves. We don't see how we behave or how our day-to-day -day life is. We think we know, but we don't see it because we're within ourselves. They see us, and at times they may comment or they say, you know, why, why did you answer the phone that way? Or why didn't you 
say that, why did, why did you say this when you didn't really do it, right? And so it really is a great reminder that it's not just you that's providing tarbiyah, they are also providing you with tarbiyah. It goes both ways, it's, it's reciprocal. So, as I was growing up, uh, the sheikh that I grew up with, he would always say this, this, this statement to me, and it really stuck with me till now. And he would always say that children or people in general, they hear you with their eyes. So they don't hear you with their ears. Like they, they hear you, but they may not be listening to you. They're really listening to you with their eyes. Because they hear what you say, but if you're not authentic and credible, as in if you're not doing what you're asking them to do, then most often they may not follow whatever it is that you're instructing them to do. So they will hear you with their eyes. And if they see that whatever it is that you're asking them to do, you are doing yourself, are you living that life that you are asking of them, that you are asking them to live, right? Then they will follow, because they now have, it, you've proven to them that you're credible, right? That you're real, that you're not just asking them for something that you don't do yourself, or that you're not following through with yourself. Um, and then, so they, they are checking to see if the medicine that you're asking, you're giving them, right? Because spirituality isn't a way of medicine. It keeps our souls in check, right? Because without spirituality, we just follow our hawa, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stated in the Quran, وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى, right? We cannot live based on our desires because our desires will lead us to destruction. But if you are basically taking this medicine yourself, Right? Then you can ask of them to take it as well. Now, parenting has been split up into three stages. Um, according to Ali, radiallahu anhu, he states, لَعَبْ إِنَّكَ سَبَانْ وَأَدِّبْهُ سَبَانْ وَصَحِبْهُ سَبَانْ ثُمَّ تُرُقُوا بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ So, play with your child for the first seven years of their life. Right? Field trips, outings, museums, playdates, um, you know, all of that stuff galore. Right? Guided, non-guided play, they're basically picking up on the values of Islam through the way that you live your day-to-day -day life. What is it that you refrain from and what is it that you engage in? And they pick up and learn from observational learning, right? Second set of seven years is formal instruction, right? Where you are formally uh, putting them in schools, right? Madrasas, Quran classes, weekend schools. Um, in addition to modeling that spirituality within the home. And then the last set of seven years, between the ages of 15 through 21, and this is something that's really hard for parents to do, is to befriend your child. Only be a friend, right? And what does a friend do? Can we ever really make our friends do anything? Or can we make decisions for them? Not really. Right? And oftentimes when you try to be that forceful, you may lose that friend, even if they're on the wrong path. So it's the same thing with our children. Right? You formally instructed them, you played with them the first seven years, you built that foundation, right? that love. They have this love for you because they want to be around you. You're lighthearted, you make things creative, you make things fun. And then the second set of seven years, you, you are formally instructing them, you're actually teaching them. And then the last set, because inshallah you built the right foundation, now they're, they can go out into the world and they're teenagers, right, or early adulthood, and they're experiencing the world for how it is, right? And they may not make the best decisions, but as a friend, right, or as a khalil, right, you are there to guide very subtly, very gently, and advise, right? and you draw from examples from your own life, but you're not shoving it down their throat. You're giving them some space to make mistakes. And then we learn from our mistakes, right? We have recap sessions. So let's talk about what happened, right? And giving them some alone time as well so that it's not always, you know, on your own watch. You have to ensure that they're also ready to have that discussion. Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the five pillars of Islam, we often look at them as requirements, right? 
that these are five things that we have to do in order to attain Jannah. But in actuality, the five pillars of Islam are actually a means of empowerment for us as Muslims. They are not just a set of guidelines and requirements. And what I mean by that is they are pillars in which we lean on whenever we're struggling, whenever we're in a state of confusion, whenever everything around us is going crazy and spiraling, we use the five pillars to ground us, to bring us back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you think about it, salah comes from the word silah, which means connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remaining connected to the one who created us and knows us best. And what does that give us? That gives us peace of mind, that gives us solace, and that gives us a correct understanding of our purpose. So if you are continuously connected to the one who created you, most likely you won't waver too much off the path. You will always somewhat come back to your foundation. And then when we talk about, um, so what, what age are children supposed to start praying? Seven. seven right? You're supposed to start introducing the concept of prayer at the age of seven and start admonishing them if they're not praying by the age of 10, which gives you three years to help them establish a lasting connection to Salah, right? It's not all at once. So first, maybe they'll start praying with you, right, when they turn seven, and then you gradually transition them to be able to pray on their own, right? And it can't be forceful, and it can't be through aggressive strategies and techniques. It cannot, they cannot be associating yelling, screaming, arguments, fighting every time they, you tell them, come, let's pray, right? And their mind will take them there. Because what happens is when they grow up as adults, and I see this so often, they stop praying completely altogether. And they don't even want anyone to tell them, come and pray. Because they automatically associate that word with all of these negative memories and experiences that they've had as a child. So, um, in, so they start praying at the age of seven, you start admonishing them at the age of ten if they're not praying. Um, and then, in order to get them to continue praying, they cannot, they cannot continue with something that they do not fully really understand. So why do we pray? We pray that so that we stay connected to our Creator, so that we stay connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But who is Allah? And what purpose does He serve in our lives? And yes, you do have to break it down to that level. So as they're, they're growing, you know, ages 4, 5, 6, 7, you start introducing the 99 names of Allah. Allah has given us attributes and characteristics of His, some which are solely His, right? We do not... Allah has not, you know, instilled that, some of those traits and attributes within us, but some of them He has. And so we start introducing who Allah is and what is Allah capable of and what are Allah's abilities. What can Allah do? Right? Why should I stay connected to Him? Right? And because our children cannot love that which they do not know. Right? The reason why we love Rasulullah is because we know so many intimate details about his life, his struggle, his lifestyle, and who his spouses and children were. Right, So we have developed an emotional connection with the Rasul. That if they don't know anything about Allah and we're telling them, here, you have to pray, right? Why aren't you praying? You're going to go to Jahannam if you don't pray. right? And you're constantly driving them or mobilizing them through guilt. They're not going to pray. They're not going to continue praying when they're independent and on their own. Because they never develop that accurate understanding of who Allah is. right? And there's this amazing website called creativemotivations.com. And it has so many different activities using the 99 names of Allah that you can do with your children. right? In order to introduce who Allah is and then embody and exemplify these 99 names, right, these attributes in our lives. How can I be merciful, right? Even with people who I may not be so fond of, even with people who wrong me, how should I really exemplify mercy? Because that's when it really shows your true colors, right? When it's with someone 
who they exchange with is a little bit difficult, right? Um, or how do I exemplify patience, right? And sometimes when you tell them about your day, you describe incidents in which you have to be very patient, or in which you have to be forbearing, or you have to be generous, right? In order for them to start making that connection with Allah's 99 names and, and how they can um, how that can manifest in their own lives. Now, in regards to wudu, for example, when they come to make wudu, you start making the connection between when you wash your hands and your feet and you rinse your mouth, where did your feet go today, right? What did your hands do today? Did you use your hands to write a note that hurt someone's feelings? Or did you kick someone, right? either intentionally or unintentionally, yet you didn't apologize or you didn't take accountability for your actions, right? So you start making the connection between wudu, which is a process of cleansing, right, and hygiene to maintain their own hygiene and cleanliness, and also that they need to start taking accountability for everything that they're adha uh, or that they're, um, you know, limbs. limbs, right, that their limbs have done right, that day. And then also that wudu is an anger management tool because there is many hadith that state that what do you do when you're angry, right? How do you, how do you d diminish that rage that you feel whenever you feel angry? You go and you make wudu, right? And it will be a coolness upon you. Um, now, moving on to zakah. Right, zakah and sadaqah. Um, and this is really important because oftentimes um, children are taught, and this is, this is where entitlement comes from, that, you know, I don't have to worry about being poor, right? I don't, have, I don't have to worry about poverty and malnourishment and the struggle of the less privileged because I'm not from that category, right? But it's really important to start introducing this concept that mom and dad's money is not really theirs, right? We work hard for our risk, and that's where um, risk comes from. Risk is when you work hard for something and then you are rewarded for it. Whereas, you know, a hiba or a gift is given to those who are deserving and to those who are undeserving alike, right? You don't have to exert any effort to get a gift, right? So they need to start understanding that our money is not ours, right? It could be gone overnight, right? It happens to many people. And that we could use a portion of our money for our own selves to take care of our own needs, but then who else can we share our risk with, right? Who can we share our wealth with? Do you have a friend who needs something that you could buy for them or that you can express your love and appreciation for them that will make them happy? Um, or remember that homeless man that we would always see in that parking lot Maybe we can give him something, right? Maybe we can buy him a care package or make him a care package and give it to him. So always expanding their mind and, and allowing them to entertain new ideas, right, that are not just about me, myself, and I, right, or about me and my siblings and my immediate family. Yeah, it's a lot more than that. And then also the adab of giving that it's not, you're not doing them a favor by giving them right, this money, or helping them, or giving them sadaqah, or helping them with their problem, you're not doing them a favor. That people have a right over your wealth, right, if you have wealth to spend, and that, you know, if you relieve a stressor or, or a burden, off of a Muslim, Allah will relieve one of your burdens on the Day of Judgment. So teaching them these concepts, and that can be a form of sadaqah, right? Um, fasting. Fasting is an act, is a deed that is only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You refrain from halal food and drink only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a form of teaching yourself self-discipline and also so that you feel the pain that the less privileged feel. You can never possibly empathize with someone when you haven't even remotely felt what their struggle feels like. Right? If you're constantly in the realm of the privileged which is like the 1% of the world, if you're constantly in that bubble, how can you possibly even think about helping them or thinking, brainstorming solutions to help them if you've never felt their struggle? 
You don't know what the pangs of hunger feel like, right? And even though it's not on the same level, because you, alhamdulillah, you have food at the end of the day, right? But at least you experienced it to an extent, right? And then the act of hajj, right? Taking your children, if possible, at an age in which it's safe, for them to experience what the concept of ummah means, and brotherhood and sisterhood, and how we're side by side, and how it's very similar to the day of accountability, right? It gives them an image to go to every time they think about accountability, right? Um, now, reasons for disconnect. Why do we have, why do we, why do we come across so many adults that are disconnected from spirituality today, right? And this falls under, there's many reasons, right? Some of them are that these, right, grown adults were raised in homes in which the parents may have worshipped Allah, they may have prayed and they may have fasted, but they never shared their love for prayer or why they pray, right? That it, it, when you pray, it creates a buffer between me and my trials, right? I ha I'm, I'm more composed, I'm more calm when things around me are all falling apart, right? As opposed to someone who doesn't pray, they, they tend to collapse more easily, right? They don't, they're not as spiritually resilient or as emotionally resilient as someone who is constantly connected with their creator, right? So they, they may have grown up in a home in which parents did things on their own and they never really shared that love and never really allowed their children to have these experiences with them, right? Or, I also hear this one a lot too, and it's, I don't really see a need for it, right? It's an inconvenience. I'm an executive director, I'm a doctor, I'm this, I'm that. And my work schedule doesn't really allow me to take a break to pray. And they don't realize that if there's a will, there's a way, right? Because you also have the other end of the spectrum in which there are doctors and there are executive directors who do take two minutes here, five minutes there, to make sure that that prayer, that they get that prayer in, right? Because they're committed and because they understand why they're doing it and what purpose it serves in their life, along with many other reasons. Now, just like, just like, um, just like um, we celebrate lifelong commitments like marriage or embarking on a new career, um, or celebrating an anniversary or a 10 plus year friendship with a friend, um, the, the beginning of the commitment of Salah is something to be celebrated, right? And this is part of the creativity. You can have a Salah party for your children, right? Um, and you can have something like a prayer book in which family, friends, and relatives, and family can all write messages to your child about what purpose prayer served in their life as adults, now that they're 50, 60, 40, 30 even, right? What purpose has Salah served so that when they're going through their lows in spirituality, even years down the road, they can always refer to this because it was written by adults, right? For them, for their future selves. And this is, this is just one idea out of many that you can incorporate to celebrate this lifelong commitment that you can now, you're now at a mature age where you can actually talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly, right? You don't need any mediators. You don't need anyone. You can just talk to him directly. Now that you're seven years old, now you're at an age where you can connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you can ask him for anything and he will understand. And he will always be there for you, right? As opposed to the world that we live in is in a constant state of change, right? Friends move away, friends, new friends come, teachers change, right? People die, people are born. There's, they will automatically start to make the connection that everything around them is always changing, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will never disappoint, right? And then I'll just end with this, that one of the other research studies from the non-Muslim perspective um, by Van Dyke and Elias, it's, the research study was actually about youth and how they were able to maintain their spirituality. And they actually found something that's so amazing that is actually recur a recurring theme in the Quran, and that is the concept of forgiveness. That youth who were taught how to forgive were actually able to be spiritual, were actually able to be better spiritually connected. 
and this is a huge other topic of discussion, right? Because there's many family feuds, there's many siblings who no longer talk to each other, there's cousins, like relatives, friends who cut off, cut each other off. But do you model, can you model how you've forgiven someone who has greatly hurt you, insulted you, offended you, or caused you pain? And explaining to them that when I forgive them, I take that power back. Because I'm basically showing them that they no longer have that power to hurt me and ruin my life. That I take that power and I now have that peace of mind. I forgive them and I've moved past that. If they want to be stuck in that, that's up to them. But I've let that go, right? For my own peace of mind and, and for your own you know, quality of life. And you draw from examples of the prophets, right, and how many times they were hurt, physically hurt at times, to which they were bleeding, and how they forgave. The story of Ta'if is a perfect prime example, in which the prophet, they threw rocks and stones at him, and he said, no, do not destroy this city. He told Jibreel, do not destroy it. Lest there be one person who grows up to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from amongst them. So having this spirit of forgiveness, right, and carrying that with them, it will serve them greatly as adults. And I will end here. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Inshallah, Brother Jabir will continue on with his portion of the presentation, which was on resiliency. Um, we are aware that Aisha is coming in, so Brother Jabir will start the presentation, and then we will break for Aisha, most likely. Yes, and then we'll be coming back to continue that uh, his presentation and also our portion, our portion of the uh, closing remarks and the Q and A, because I imagine that there's people here who would like to do the Q and A. The program is set to end um, at nine thirty, inshallah. So hopefully you all will be here for that, and also for our further discussion about um, the Khalil Center, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Anya and uh, Sister Hibba, mashallah, both segments were really beneficial. Um, just before we begin, I think there's some sign-up sheets, if we can get those, or if it hasn't already been passed around, um, if we can get those passed around, inshallah, it would be really beneficial so that uh, everyone in the audience can stay in touch with Khalil Center after, after this program, inshallah, to know what else activities and programs take place throughout the Bay Area. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah So inshallah my segment is going to be on resiliency um, as uh, Dr. Anya uh, alluded to earlier So um, I know also we're a little tight on time so forgive me if I seem like I'm going to zoom through this um, So follow along if you can see inshallah on the powerpoint there So socially and emotionally conscious child rearing towards producing psychological resilience so what is resilience? Let's define that. So first, resilience is creating or protecting the psychological state in your child so that they, perhaps in the future, are protected against distress, both you know, psychological and I will also add spiritual, right? So any types of things that happen, we want to build that ability for them in the future to be able to protect themselves from any type of distress, right? And this is, uh, you know, the topic is very specific to children. But this is kind of, uh, you know, it can be applied to ourselves as well. So where you can, apply this, inshallah, to yourselves as well. But the Islamic definition, we can also look at it from a different perspective, and we can call it himma, right? Many of us have heard, or we use the word himma, right? Having himma. But here the concept is ulumul himma. And that's having a higher level of thinking, a higher process, a higher level, right, of, of this resilience. And what is the definition of that? In Nabratul Naim, fi Akhlaq Rasul al Karim, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is a definition that's given on Ulu al Himma, and that is to consider everything other than your objective insignificant. This is the definition given in, uh, uh, in this one context. To consider everything other than your objective as insignificant. And Shaykh Hashim, mashallah, was a uh, very prominent scholar who currently lives in Pakistan, but he was an American convert to Islam. He recently had a seminar, many of you who are from the Bay Area may have at least heard of this program, it was a holistic health workshop. And he gave an example of this himma, specifically this ulu al himma, where he said a cheetah, when a cheetah is looking to hunt, although there may be 30, 40 different animals in the area, he'll focus on one. He'll focus on one, 
And no matter what happens around him, he'll focus on that one. So he gives this example with regards to him. So, so continue, inshallah, with the, with the, with the uh, PowerPoint getting into it. Um, human beings in general are getting smarter, right? As the, uh, as the time moves forward and as the technology gets better and the education gets better, human beings in general are getting better, at least in academics for sure. In academics, human beings are getting much better, right? In the educational world, kids are getting uh, a lot smarter. For that same reason, actually, we cannot use intelligence testing equipment that was made 30 years ago on children today. Why? Because the children today would look like geniuses if they took those tests. Right? And the Muslim community, however, they are suffering, uh, and they're a lot more vulnerable to psychological and, I would add, spiritual distress. Right? Like Sister Heba was mentioning, some of the, the concepts of how to raise that child. Not to hate Islam. How can you create a sense you know, of religion, of faith, within your small children so that it permeates their heart. So it's a natural occurring thing. It's a normal thing. Not something that, you know, when you hear the name of it, you immediately remember your father or mother screaming at you and yelling at you and taking up the belt. You know, you don't think of that. You don't associate Islam to that. So, you know, what are some of the issues that the Muslim youth are having, specifically with regards to psychological and spiritual distress? One of those things is being unable to read context clues, right? Or being unable to respond to social contexts. For example, you walk into a masjid, what are the etiquettes of the masjid? Or when an elder walks into the room, what is, you know, generally a person supposed to do? Being able to tell the appropriate, you know, behavior for that appropriate place. There was a... So, here, I'll skip that. So, um, let's see. Another example of this is, for example, when you're talking to someone... Uh, and kind of like right now, when you're talking to someone and you notice that they're really tired, they're really ready to go home, they're exhausted, but you just keep going on and on and on and on, right? Being able to read these social clues. So the next slide has the statistics. If we can get the statistics up. Uh, the third slide. It has some data, right? With, uh, there are some Muslim studies that were done, which Khalil Center, mashallah, has a part of uh, in some of it. Um, that talks about religious affiliation being at an all-time low point right now. Religious affiliation being at an all-time low point, while psychological distress as an, is at an all-time high. Right? So depression, anxiety, you're noticing more of these things. Although religion is a protective variable, meaning it's something that does give us a sense of strength, right? and it gives us the ability to create this psychological resilience, this himma. What else gives us, gives us that? Islam gives us that. Our religion gives us that. Right? Sheikh Hashim, the same scholar that I was referring to earlier, he has a program called the Ubudiyya model. And what that is, is it essentially it's changing a person's mind frame and mindset to be a, a godly model, to be God conscious. And what does that mean? He has this very specific concept called paradigm inversion. Now, many of us have heard of the, the term paradigm shift when you have to change things. But he says, and he proposes that idea, that we need a paradigm inversion. Completely flip it upside down. We need to start doing things not for goodness sake, but for God's sake. We need to have a God consciousness. Right? A God compass. And if you just can see by these statistics, they're pretty shocking statistics. Right? Nearly 50% of college age Muslim students are involved in premarital you know, relations. Right? Almost 50% of, of uh, Muslim youth in colleges are involved in drinking alcohol and all the other you know information is there so what are some of the challenges facing the youth right there are three main things that the youth are being faced with and, and challenged with right now right and that is um, lack of social support acculturation and their beliefs and values a Muslim identity a sense of where do I belong because that's very difficult you see all the things that's happening what the media is portraying about Muslims you know, I was very young when 9-11 happened. But the truth is, I didn't even know what was happening until like two, three years later. I had no idea. And every time someone would say something about Muslims, I'm like, what? what are you talking about Muslims? Muslims are totally cool people. We have really good food. We're really loud. We're cool people to hang out with. What, what are you guys talking about? I literally thought 
Muslims, the way the media and the television was portraying it, was a whole different species or like a create, you know, some sort of creation or something, right? So how do the Muslim youth right now deal with that? What is their belief? You know, what do they, uh, you know, associate themselves with? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ That you are the, we as Muslims are the best people on the face of this earth that has been selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what reason? To encourage people to do good and to prohibit people from doing evil and acts of obscenity and the cherry on top is that and you believe in Allah. This makes us the greatest people on earth. Alhamdulillah. This is a great ni'mat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to embrace that. Why is that such a you know great feeling? So these are some of the challenges some of the youth are facing. Um, and what we'll do is we'll take a pause, inshallah, here. I think it's a good point to take a break. Um, and we'll pray salatu al-isha, inshallah. So anyone who needs to make wudu can make wudu. But we'll go ahead and get started with salatu al-isha. And we will continue uh, right after, inshallah. So we'll just read one quick hadith, inshallah, as part of the tradition of the masjid. وعن جابر بن سمرة رضي الله تعالى عنهما قال خرج علينا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال ألا تصفون كما تصف الملائكة عند ربها؟ فقلنا يا رسول الله وكيف تصف الملائكة عند ربها؟ قال يتمون الصفوف الأول ويتراصون في الصف رواه مسلم. So on the authority of Jabir ibn Samura, who says that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to us, he came out to us once and he said, Why do you not stand in rows as the angels do before their, their love, before Allah? So he asked, O Messenger of Allah, how do the angels stand in rows before their Rabb, before Allah? How do the malaika stand? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded, They complete each row beginning with the first, and they fill all the gaps. This is a hadith narrated in Sahih Muslim. May Allah grant us tawfiq and the ability to make amal on this and to try to get the first saw. Okay. So, uh, we're going to start with the sister, we're going to go back and forth, and so we'll next to the sister, we're Inshallah, we're going to actually continue the Brother Japanese talk. Inshallah, there was a, a short interruption with um, his talk, so we're going to continue that, and then we'll do Q&A, inshallah. So for those who are rejoining us, Welcome back to our parenting discussion for tonight. This is a discussion on instilling resiliency and nurturing spirituality. Um, I'm joining you, uh, Rani Awad, from the Khalil Foundation tonight, and also Sister Hiba and Brother Jabir who have been presenting. For those who didn't catch the introductory remarks, the Khalil Center is a Muslim counseling center that has professionally trained therapists that are both trained in the Western therapeutic concepts and are licensed, are working towards licensure professionally in uh, the state of California, but in addition are being trained in Islamic psychotherapy concepts and also pursuing their own Islamic um, learning, inshallah, so that they can infuse that in with the therapy. Um, and we hope to make that therapy accessible to everybody. I went through the financial model of how to seek out counseling and care, and also um, kind of our goals in making sure that there's also educational opportunities for the entire Bay Area. And we're very pleased to be here tonight for the first time in Pleasant at the MCC. We've been to the other, other community centers and other massages. And so, as Brother Javed was mentioning before we broke for Aisha, please do sign up your email on the Khalil Center email list. It's infrequent emails, but when we do have community forums like this or panels or discussions, that's what you will be receiving through email. So if you hope to hear from the Khalil Center again soon, please do sign up. And I have briefly mentioned that there's also a sign-up sheet for consultation sessions. There's an idea being proposed through the MCC here. Since our site is all the way in Santa Clara and it's far from this community, um, that we may have some staff members on site here from the Khalil Center to do some counseling and consultation sessions. So if that is something of interest to you, your friends, your families, etc., 
please do um, sign up, not for specific slots, but just for interest, so we see if there really is that kind of interest from the community here, inshallah. With that, I'm going to turn the mic back over to Brother Jabir to continue his slides, and then we will open the floor for Q&A, inshallah. So inshallah, continuing with the slide, we won't uh, waste any more time, inshallah. So as we were talking, um, just right before we stopped, we were talking about kind of some of the challenges that Muslim youth face today. Now, why is it important to build social, you know, socially and emotionally strong uh, uh, Muslim youth? And like I said in the beginning, you can apply this to yourself as well. Why is this important? Why is building resilience something important? Well, interestingly enough, you can predict, you can actually predict better academic outcomes based on how socially and emotionally strong and healthy a person is, right? A growing body of literature, as you can see on the, uh, on the PowerPoint, a growing body of literature suggests that children who are socially and emotionally stronger, who have more social and emotional uh, wellness, they you know, have a higher probability of raising their grades and test scores, bolstering their enthusiasm for learning, reduce behavior problems, and enhance the brain's cognitive functions. And this is an interesting concept because the thing is, is that if you have, you know, and I'll give you an example, you have an extremely intelligent young child, right? But that child lacks confidence or that child lacks this social and wellness, uh, uh, socially, um, uh, socially emotional wellness, right? He lacks this ability to be, for example, confident or the ability to be able to interact and socialize, right? And then you have a kid who is not so intelligent, Right? But he has all of these qualities. It is likely that that child who has more of this uh, you know, social and emotional wellness, he can do better on his examination, can do actually better in his grades. Right? And actually, if you look at the, you know, if you look at the, there's two extremes. Extremely rich and wealthy people and extremely, extremely poor and poverty-stricken people. Right? Emotionally, they're not actually doing so well. But who is doing pretty good? Uh, uh, people who are right in the middle. So people who are right in the middle are actually the ones who do a little bit better. And then more interestingly enough is the people who are right above the poverty line, just right above it, they're actually doing the best. They have more contentment in life, right? And if you see also from the, the tradition of the Prophet وسلم, who says, the Prophet وسلم, says that indeed I have only been set to perfect, right, to perfect character, human, you know, uh, um, uh, our social uh, conduct with one another. And why is that important? Because again, understanding how to interact with one another, building a sense of community, building a sense of ukhuwa and brotherhood and sisterhood in, the, in Islam. This is what the Prophet وسلم, was sent for. And we also learned that you know, an example of this is what? Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was a Sahabi, who is, you know, when you read the hadith, you usually read, or most of the time you read Abu Huraira, right? Abu Huraira mentioned this hadith. Abu Huraira was not, the, did not have the strongest memory. But Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu had the sohba of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he was with the Prophet. So he learned all of these, you know, uh, social and emotional, you know, uh, skills. How to be around people, how to, you know, when a musibah afflicts you, when something big happens to you, how do you react? Do you just give up and give up on the world? Or how did he was observing the Prophet وسلم, And in this, this is an example for us, how that can affect a person. Right? And in recent, you know, there's some studies as well that show that, you know, changes in academic achievement could better predict, you know, uh, 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 children's social competence. Right? Children can actually do better based on their uh, social emotional wellness uh, in their grades as well. Like I mentioned in the beginning of the slide, in academics, right? This is this is um, this is uh, evident. And the last part of this actually, there's an Islamic um, there's an Islamic Muslim study that's done here. I'm not sure if it's the last one. I think there's one more. Yeah, right. This is done by Muslims on the effect of spirituality and how important that is to have spiritual sense of right connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an interesting fact right an interesting fact is that in the time of <clears throat> the Bedouin Arabs at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam why were the children of Quraysh natural born leaders what was one quality that they had I mean this was 
common amongst Arabs at that time, but in Quraysh, they, they were really emphatic about this. They sent their children when they were young out into the deserts with, so that they can be raised amongst other children and people would teach them tarbiya. And they would grow and the children would interact, right? And the children, they would have the opportunity to be children. But it was being shaped in a natural way to build character and interacting with other children. And not being restricted so that children are not, are not able to be children, right? Because you're molding them into something else. So it was a great shift. Ashraf Ali Talib, rahimahullah, who one time, one of his students came when he brought his child. And that child sat in front of him in tashahud position, with his head down, not moving. So the sheikh said, you know, who is this? He goes, this is my son. He goes, this is not your son. This is an angel. You brought an angel here. Why is he, you know, he, this is not a kid. Kid runs around. Kid has fun. Kids make noise. Right? So allowing that. So this was a noble quality of the children of Quraysh. So that they had this opportunity so that when they got older, right, they were naturally able to lead a nation. Able to lead a people. And that's why you see today, actually, that you have, you know, uh, youth camps and, and, and camps for young children to, to you know, to, to create that within them. So, so the next slide has, you know, the benefits of being socially and emotionally strong, right? It shows that resilient children are less likely to become depressed. They are less likely to become hopeless and helpless, more, and they're more likely to persist in problem solving. They're willing to take risks. They're more likely to reach appropriate milestones. And what's a good example of that in our history? Osama ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was 17 years old, who was sent to lead the army of the Muslimin to Sham. He was 17 years old. I mean, if we think of a 17 year old today, we, we, don't, we really don't think that he's going to go lead a Muslim army with like the, the elder Sahaba, Umar ibn al-Khattab and the, the, the other Sahaba with him to go lead an army into, you know, into Sham. So what are the benefits of it? You have an example like that in our own Islamic tradition. And then you have, right, factors for the lack of resilience. So children without this sense of himma and this resilience, what does that create? Right, it can create internally a sense of anxiety and low self-esteem, academic failure, ineffective coping strategies, emotional dysregulation, and poor social skills. And then environmentally, in, environmentally, the effects are that perhaps that child, right, he's, gonna, he's growing up in a harsh and inconsistent uh, uh, environment with discipline within the family that changes. For example, the mother will tell a child one thing, don't do this. Then the kid will go to his father and the father will say, oh, don't for, you know, forget about that, mom's too mean. You know, just go ahead and do whatever you want. It's inconsistent. The child will not know who to listen to. And if you see, sometimes, in, you know, amongst the older generation, you'll see that if the, if the father figure said something, that was it. That was it. That was, you know, his statement goes. Right? Some of the other environmental uh, harms are unclear boundaries. Children don't know to who we can say what and to act a certain way where. Exposure to violence, poor peer associations. So what can we do to protect, right? To create some protective factors, right? Some internal protective factors. Having optimism. This is a great thing, right? Being optimistic. Right? Having emotional awareness, being, having flexible thinking, self-efficacy and esteem and empathy. Right? When the Prophet ﷺ, right, once he passed by a young boy and his bird had passed away. Right? So he said, he said, so he comes up to him and he sees that he's distressed. So he says, Ya Aba Umayr, ma'afala bin Nughayr. Right? Just saying something sweet and kind to this young boy. And at that time he could have easily said, it's just a bird. What? Get over it, you know, and that happened. That's so common, you know, and it's almost, I mean, it's not funny, but the thing is, you find the humor in the fact that it's so common that everyone knows of, 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 of having done that or having experienced that. Something that's significant to a child or to someone else, and we just totally write it off. And how do you think that little kid feels? I mean, it means something to them, clearly. So, through the Allah, we see that how he interacted that created a sense of optimism. Right? That created a sense of, you know, like you're important and what you're going through is important. So some environmental factors, right? Meaningful connection to an adult. Having that. How much that can benefit you. Having someone you can go and speak to. Realistically high expectations. Stable and consistent environment. So then what happens though? Uh, if a child uh, is in a house where he sees marital discord. And this is another issue. Right? Parents fighting in front of their children. 
right? So children with divorced or unstable par parental figures score lower on their emotional, behavioral, social, health, and academic outcomes, right? This, they, they, they rank lower. They score lower. And adults with divorced parents, so now those children grow up. So then what happens to those children when they grow up, right? They have less education, generally speaking. Lower levels of psychological well-being. They have problems in their own marriages, and then eventually they can be led to, they have the risk of encountering divorces as well, right? This is all the natija, I mean, we are all, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a creation of our environment, right? Whatever environment we surround ourselves with, that's how we become. And that's also, again, the concepts in Islam, the, the whole concept of sohba. And one of my psychology books in my undergraduate, when I was in college, I was reading it, and it was talking about the different ways of learning something, anything. How does a person learn something? And there was like different things there. One was, you know, studying in a classroom setting. Another one was uh, experiential, so just being like hands-on training. And a few other things. And then the last point that I thought was extremely interesting, and I started jotting this down, is that you don't need to do anything. You just need to be with that person. Just spend time with someone, and you will become like them, and you will learn from them. This is the concept of suhba. So now child uh, uh, self-esteem and self-efficacy. Right? What happens to that child? What can we do to, you know, to encourage that, to create that in, the, in our youth? Having husn al of that child. Having a good opinion that perhaps this kid has a need. Perhaps this child is not just acting like this for the heck of it, to drive you crazy, right? Because, subhanAllah, children and, and human beings in general have a pre-wired uh, uh, tendency to know Allah, to believe in Allah, right? Hatta ki even evolutionary psychologists state that every human being Right, have a God conscious or a God concept, right? Naturally, innately. And then, like earlier, Dr. Anya was mentioning about the hadith that how important it is for the parents to raise their children in a good environment, right? The hadith that she mentioned that kullu mauludin yuladu al fitra, fa abawahu yuhawidani aw yunasirani aw yumajasani. Right? His parents. That's so important. Your parents. Right? Every child is born upon the state of fitrah, right? however you want to define that, on the state of fitrah. Right? Their natural order, their natural tendencies. And then their parents make that child a Christian, or a Jew, or any one of our, you know, and then use another example. The parents then create this environment where the child becomes criminal, where the child becomes educated. Right? Or the child, um, you know, he becomes, he wants to do great things, or the child doesn't want to do many things. It's the environment that shapes us in that regard. And another interesting thing is that with small children, I mean, this is a bad habit. A lot of people do this. But when they're introducing their kids or the kids are running a little bit crazy, you know, the kids are going around a little bit crazy, what do they do? Yeah, we always hear this. The parents, you know, they're exhausted, they're tired. So what do they say? They introduce their children to people like, this is the shaitan. You know, this is my son shaitan here. This is Satan. And this is my other son. This is that angel, angel child. You know, they have these weird little nicknames. This is the idiot. This is the genius of the family. And we've all heard statements similar to that. And what happens? Eventually, you hear that enough times, you start to internalize that. These little kids, like they were saying earlier, right? At a small young age, Dr. Andy was mentioning, at a small young age, these things start to affect them, right? And, uh, uh, you know, we were talking in the previous slide about inconsistencies. You know, you tell your child, you know, they come, this is so common, you know, parents come to the to the imam like imam sahab what's going on with my child he's not listening to me he's not praying she's not praying she's not wearing hijab he's not you know doesn't you know a, you know look like a muslim doesn't want to associate with muslims i don't get it what's going on or you come to the therapist or you come to the psychiatrist or you come to the doctor or whatever and you ask these questions well, what's going on what's wrong you know what's wrong with my child perhaps that child saw something in you that you're telling your child to go pray salah but then at the time of salah and you're outside you don't pray what do you think that child is going to think? So wait, this doesn't make sense. You're telling me to pray, but you're not doing it. Being an example for them. Being an example for our children. Right, so then social modeling and optimism. Right, the next slide is on uh, us as human beings as being social creatures. And inshallah, I'll, uh, I'll wrap this up in the next slide. Is that how we interpret the world is solely based on the way that we socialize and the messages that we receive. And this is a very important slide, brothers and sisters. I encourage you to pay uh, you know, an additional percentage of attention to this slide, right? 
sometimes, you know, with the youth, you get, uh, you get comments like, um, you know, parents encourage their kids not to listen to music or to not watch TV because there's a lot of obscenity nowadays in the music and in the TV. So they tell them, you know, you shouldn't watch it, you shouldn't listen to it. You know, don't hang out with bad friends. Oh, my children, don't hang out with bad friends. Why? Because it has an effect on you. But then our youth, right, mashallah, they have this comment, oh, well, you know, I'm strong. I won't let it affect me, right? I won't, it won't affect me. It's not going to get to me. Okay, mashallah, that's wonderful. You have a lot of himma right now. You're young. You know, we have the saying in Farsi and Urdu, you know, you're really Jewish right now. You're really, you know, you're hot-headed. You think you've got everything, but you're still a human being. And you can't close your ears unless you plug them. So slowly, slowly, I mean, over time, you're hearing all these things, and then they start repeating. You know, they play back in your mind. They play back in your head. And you get all these thoughts, and you say, Imam Saab, you know, oh, therapist Saab, you know, I don't get why I'm hearing all these things, or I'm thinking of all of these thoughts, and they're messing with me. Well, you've been listening to all of these things. That's how you, you know, they don't come out of nowhere. You're not getting wahi, right? These things are coming from the, your environment, right? And we have a saying in Farsi, that the company of the good people will keep you good, will make you good. You don't have to do anything. It's the easiest ilaj. Just hang out with good people, you'll become good. Right? This is the tradition of, of, of Islam. A person will be amongst, you know, with those who he loves. But then the company of the bad people will make a person bad. You know, and there was a kid, he said, you know, I hang out with my friends and they smoke. And so he said, well, if, you know, he said, but I don't smoke. So, so what do you do? He said, well, I just don't breathe. I just don't inhale. I mean, really, come on, like how practical is all this, right? Okay, so just final slide, inshallah. So the cure, right? Some of the things, some things that we can do, and inshallah, I think I'll end with this slide, is, you know, what happens when your child falls into some problems, right? What do you do? How do you help them? How do you assist them? There are some examples that are given here, modeling positive self-talk, right? Teaching them optimistic thinking, being there for them, understanding that in life, sometimes things just don't go the way that we plan them, like Sister Hiba was saying. You have to acknowledge that. And this comes so much in the Quran. So much in the Quran. You know? Allah is giving us a guarantee from the get-go that this is a life that you will be tested in numerous things. Perhaps your test will be in hunger and someone else's test will be in, you know, in money, in finance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah An-Kabut, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَن يُتْرَكُوا أَن يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ does mankind think that he can easily say, I believe in Allah and that he won't get tested? I mean, subhanAllah, in, you know, in our own uh, cordial relationships, you know, uh, when people love each other, they test each other's love. And they say, oh, if you really love me, you'll do this. Or, you know, they'll put each other in tests. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again is testing us, right? These tests exist. So to, nurture, to encourage that and to nurture that in your children from the beginning, this is very important. And I'll end on this last point, inshallah, this last note, that one of my teachers, Sheikh Abdullah, MashaAllah, he's a very learned person. And he also has, MashaAllah, about five children. And he, one day, he was at the masjid and he, the imam of the masjid requested him to give a short nasiha, a short advice to the people. It's like 20 minutes. And he sat there and he said, you know, I'm a parent, I have five children, my oldest son is 13 now. Uh, yeah, 13 years old, his oldest son is 13. The youngest, I think, was like maybe a few months. And he said, I, I can't say that, you know, I'm a successful parent. I don't know where the end result of my children will be. None of us do. But he said, a litmus test for myself, a test for myself, is that, and this is what other parents can use, and this is just one test. So please don't get upset with me. I'm not saying that this is the only way to test if your children are kind of on the right path or headed in the right direction. But this is, again, just something for you to use if you don't have any tools in your toolbox. He said that to test, to see, inshallah, if you're parenting your children good, then what you can do is, if your child, if you're not at home one day, right, you're always encouraging your children to pray, to give sadaqah, to help people, to do good, to do amal khayn. You're always encouraging them. You're always telling them, you know, you should do this. And you're trying to be a model parent. And you're seeing some results from your children when you're there. But what happens when you're not there? What do your children do when you're not there? When mom and dad is not there? And they have the opportunity, you know, I don't have my phone, but... The little, you know, when they're, when, they're, when they're on their phones by themselves. 
right? And I know there's a touchy subject, but again, the idea still stands. What does your child do? What do they view? What do they listen to? And he said that, do they come to Salat al-Isha? They come with you, mashallah. Many children pray Salat al-Isha with us. I'm sure the children of many of you. And they're praying Salat al-Isha with us. Because that's, you're there with them. But what happens when that child gets older, he can drive, he has that freedom, or she has that freedom. But will they come on a random, you know, what is it, Friday night, Friday night too. You, you could be doing a lot of things Friday night. But will your child, on a random Friday night, in the random time of the year, come for Salat al-Isha on his own accord? Or on, on her own accord? And this is just one test. This is one test parents can use for themselves to gauge where their children are headed. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to conclude the whole program, but to conclude my segment. I ask sincerely, inshallah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us all the tawfiq, this divine ability from Him, that we kind of take benefit from all of this. You know, and I'm greatly and eternally, eternally thankful to the MCC board for having these live stream options and this, you know, YouTube option. So that if you miss something or you have to tend to some, you know, something on the phone or whatever, that you missed a part of this, play it again and share it again and listen to it again and, and, and take as much benefit as possible. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept and may Allah reward all of you for attending. Zakallahu khairam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Inshallah, right now we will take um, some questions. It looks like we'll start with the sister side. And we hope to have questions from both sides. We'll do as many questions as we're able to. I just ask for sake of time that you keep your question concise and short, inshallah. And we'll do our best in answering it. And if there are more personal questions of more personal nature, please know that we are we also have a table at the back that you may talk to us, not for a full therapy session, of course, but just a brief consultation if needed, um, if it's on a more personal question uh, type basis. So I ask you to keep those for the back. Table, inshallah. With that, we'll open for Q&A, and then we'll conclude formally. Um, so, like everybody else, I want my kids, uh, my older son especially, to be involved with more Muslim uh, kids. So one of the things that we have encountered uh, many times over, the kids are really smart, all the kids are studying, the studious kids, but they lack the athletic, being athletes, um, or having music abilities, because for some reason, our communities do not, uh, as they go after age eight or seven or eight, then they start sending them to soccer, or if they stop, uh, they don't want to be in the soccer team, they don't have to be in the soccer team, so the parents are not forcing them, you know, you got to keep trying, you got to keep doing it, because what you're talking about, resilience is basically what you learn, and if you're an athlete, basically, this is one of the things that they teach you, to be resilient. So, um, my question is that, you know, so my kid, my son, doesn't want to be associated with the Muslim friends, and of course they're good people, because he says that we don't have anything in common. And um, so, you know, I, I like to see that being an athlete or being a musician as being part of it and being encouraged by the parents here, so that, you know, other kids can relate to each other. Uh, so the question, my question to you is, how can I get my kid to be more involved with the other Muslims and accept them for who they are? You know, we all are different, of course. Jazakallah khair. If I understand your question correctly, you're asking, how can your son become more associated or more attuned with the Muslim, other Muslim uh, children, basically? That he maybe is more interested in music and soccer and maybe doesn't find Muslim kids that aren't? Something to that effect, mashallah. Um, the part that I'll answer and kind of focus on, and it, you're right, it does tie back into the discussion of resiliency, but we'll focus on this idea of when Muslim kids decide that they're really not so interested in this Muslim thing, and they really don't want to associate so much. Because I can tell you very clearly that in this generation, and how old is your son? Yeah, so teenager. So we're seeing this with the teens, but even starting earlier, I would say middle school, even seeping down into the elementary ages as well, where you have um, this, what I call the real, the real challenge of parenting of this era, which is saving our children from atheism, right? Saving them from not wanting Islam and not wanting to be associated with Islam and themselves questioning whether or not this Islam thing is even worth it and worth pursuing. So him, not maybe we won't focus on your son, but just say in general, the children, the youth today, of not wanting to really associate with Islam is really coming from the inside of having trouble with the concepts of Islam itself. 
So it may manifest as, but he doesn't play soccer, or he doesn't listen to the same music I listen to, right? But in reality, what we find when we start digging a little bit more is there's actually some real aqidah questions going on inside. That they're not actually sure if this Islam thing is really for them. And that's what I say is, is really the, the big challenge that's happening. Because Brother Jabir was saying, there were youth who lined up and prayed Aisha with us right now, alhamdulillah. And the question he posed was, what, would they be here if it wasn't for the fact that the parents were here? But my question, I'll ask a secondary question. That's a very good question. Let's ask a second question. How many of those who are praying, and they're actually here on a Friday night in the masjid praying, not just running around, actually praying, but are doing it because they actually understand what prayer is, and there's a true belief in this thing called prayer that they're doing. And for the older kids I'm talking about, not the little ones, alhamdulillah, we encourage them so it can grow, but the older ones, the teens and up. Because I can't tell you how many, well, I would say clients, people that we see in therapy now, whose parents have brought them forward, or they themselves have come forward, and they'll say, I go with my father to the gym, to the uh, Jama or to Aisha every night. We have one every night goes to Aisha, prays side by side with his father. But in confidence, said to us, but I don't believe. I'm not a Muslim. Ya Akni, you are coming to the masjid. You are praying Aisha side by side with your father. And inside of him, he's rejected the faith. This is the challenge of today. Back in my era, I grew up here and earlier, right? It was be careful, make sure that they don't date, make sure they don't smoke, right? Make sure they don't use drugs, right? This is the fear of the suhba that was the bad, that Brother Jabba talked about suhba, right? Companionship, bad companionship. All of that applies today with today's youth, but in addition, there's a real crisis of faith with our youth. So my posing back about the, the, all, the, all of those who feel like they have children who are maybe kind of questioning about faith or maybe it's manifesting as I don't want to associate with the Muslims or they do this thing <laughs> very commonly, right? They, we know the, all of these stories, right? They, they supposedly wear hijab, but they get to school and yank it off, right? Or maybe even more than that, maybe they're not wearing hijab to begin with, but they out of the house in one outfit been in school with a completely different one that was packed in their backpack or underneath what they were wearing, right? Which is problematic. Or to a more, uh, going on at the surface, very shallow level, but on a deeper level, on a deeper level, what's really going on inside, the struggles that are inside, of I really don't want this Islam thing. And in that case, there's a lot of work that has to happen in terms of actually building up the foundation of Al-Qaeda again. Because that's really, there's, and we see here with the youth groups, I was telling you about the girls' youth groups that we run here at the MCC on Friday night through the Rahma Foundation. Girls of every, from the entire spectrum, from every edge of the Bay Area, right? From every social economic class and every ethnic group and every language group <laughs> come here. And they may have nothing in common, but what's fostered through the youth group is a real sense of sisterhood. And that's really the whole purpose of what we do here. I've heard people say, oh, but you know, I, I, eh, it's not so important that they go to a youth group. And I'm not saying you have to send your kid to youth group. I'm just saying what it is we do here. Um, they go to Sunday school, they go here, they go there. And that's enough. Look, I've been to Sunday school. You've been to Sunday school. We've all been to Sunday schools. And alhamdulillah, there's an I'm component, a knowledge component, but not necessarily a sisterhood or brotherhood fostering component. That love and that connection to other Muslim kids, right, other Muslim girls, other Muslim boys, has to happen. And I prefer that it happen in the masjid environment, and it happen in not a very didactic, formal, lecturing style. Because that sisterhood and that love gets lost in the writing on the board, which has to happen, because they have to learn. But they also need bonds of sisterhood and brotherhood. So here at the MCC, I would say you all are blessed, mashallah. Your girls have, from ages 4 through 18 plus, and the women themselves have a halakha. Right? Every age of girls has a halakha here. And for the boys, alhamdulillah, that's starting. Right? Very soon, inshallah, within a couple of weeks, we're rolling out the boys' halakhas, inshallah. The equivalent of what the girls have been doing. So, inshallah, bring your sons forward because they'll find other soccer buddies in that group. And they'll find other, uh, question mark on the music, buddies, <laughs> inshallah. But, um, the, uh, the other buddies, right? And over time, they really will develop these bonds of brotherhood, I hope, inshallah. But what really needs to be addressed through the fun and through the activities are questions of aqidah. 
And that's what we do here. We don't lecture to the girls, but through the nasheed and through the activities and through the everything, there's some solid aqidah lessons they're getting in terms of being a Muslim and being proud to be a Muslim. So I hope, inshallah, that helps in answering that question, yeah. Do you have any definition of Muslim identity and uh, have you agreed upon it? Number and if yes, have we tried? Have you seen any you know success model in a community where any Islamic center has implemented that Muslim identity for the kids? And uh, the other question is like, uh, how can we basically attract the youth to this to the Islamic centers uh, to create that peer environment? Because I think just uh, some some Islamic centers. Have done some out of the box kind of you know, scenarios in which they have really worked hard to create that those environments for their children, uh, especially in the Texas area. I think. Uh, do you think that you know is there any success model for for that kind of environment for for a community? Would you like to speak on that? I can speak on the balance afterwards. So I think the, the question was how to establish a Muslim identity. First question. Second question, is there any successful models that uh, have been implemented that actually work? So I mean, at least with regards to Muslim identity, I can only speak from my own personal background. And I take it for what it is. Um, you know, myself personally, and the sister also, I just kind of want to uh, get her attention that myself personally I, mean, I was born and raised here you know, in the Bay Area in Fremont I grew up here I lived the normal I guess you could say Muslim American lifestyle but the thing that really pulled me into Islam and pulled me into faith in general because we're talking about Muslim identity here right and that I know it's different for every person because every person goes through different challenges and they have different things that they're that they're dealing with right so it becomes difficult but to understand that you know who we are in that ayat of the Quran that I read earlier, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to who Muslims are, right? You're the best of people. This is like a bashara. This is like some like good news to letting you know that who you are, what you stand for, what you represent. And I know from my own personal example, right, um, that as growing up in this country, right around 9-11, you know, right around 9-11 and having to deal with that, it was very difficult because of the random comments that you would get for the faith that you believe in. And that's why it's so important having this resiliency, having that himma, because you need to understand your foundations first. Who you are, like Dr. Ravi is talking about, having aqidah, right? Where is your set of beliefs at? Where do you stand? Where are you grounded, first and foremost? Right? So if your foundation is strong, then the, the rest of that person's growth, inshallah, will also be strong. But you have to also um, create that environment for that person. So for myself, I mean, hanging around the right company and the right people, Whatever was around, like this masjid here, for example, we'll take this example. If there's activities to bring your children and bring them here, right? Have that person or that group of people that that child can connect with, who they feel connected to, who they feel connected to, right? And sometimes, I mean, the challenge is that you have people, and this is a reality, you, we, we have people bringing their kids to the masjid or to the masajid, and we're saying, why aren't they attracted to the masjid? And what is the khatib talking about? Are they even relatable topics? Are they subjects that even have anything to do with what that kid is talking about, what that kid is experiencing? I know myself in the Bay Area, in the, in the I keep saying the Bay Area like I'm somewhere else, like in the like in the Fremont, Hayward, Tri-City area where I'm originally from, there are some massages that only speak in one language, whether it be Farsi or Urdu, right? 
and they only speak in that language. And sometimes the people that come there, you know, even if you know the, the speaker speaks at a high level of Urdu or Farsi, the kids don't speak that high level of Urdu or Farsi. So it's not easy for them to understand what he's saying. You know? Or for example, another thing that I found kind of funny is that the Imam, his entire congregation is non Arab. And he'll say, so you know, and stand in the rows and strengthen the lines and this and that. And then he talks about why aren't the rows straight? They don't even know what you just said to them. That's a kind of important, right? So same thing with the khatib. I've been to numerous masajid where the youth in that masjid don't go to that masjid anymore. They went when they were kids because they had to. Then when they got older, you never see them again. When do you see them? Janaza. When do you see them? Eid Salat. Maybe Juma if they're really good, you know. But why? Because that's one factor to consider. Why aren't they coming home? Do they even know what he's talking about? Or is it, you know, what is the subject? What are the topics being discussed? These are extremely relevant. These are extremely important as to why some of the children won't come. Children's why some of the youth won't don't come to the masjid. Now that's one thing. Another thing is in environment, right? Some masjid and sometimes I mean I don't want to blame the masjid or anything like that, but it just has this vibe to it where the youth are not welcome. There doesn't need to be a gym inside of the masjid for the youth to come to the masjid, but the idea stands that there should just still be an accepting or, or a welcoming environment in the masjid. Right? I've personally experienced, personally, when I was in my undergraduate, I went to a masjid, and the people of the masjid told me that, you know, what are you doing here? I said, well, it's about Dhuhr time, so I'm going to pray Dhuhr. And he said, uh, and so he didn't think I was Afghan, because right, I was wearing my Western clothing. And so he started speaking in Farsi, saying, get this kid out of here. Why is he here? He's wasting time. He's saying it to another guy. And I just looked at him and I said, SubhanAllah, like, I just really, I just want to pray Dhuhr. You know? So that, that environment exists. And if that does exist, perhaps that's another reason to why some people might not feel so comfortable. Right? And we've heard that. You hear that all the time. Um, and Dr. Ina has a few comments also with regards to the implementation of some models that work. So I'll hand it off to her, John. The, you asked about, are there any models that work? And I'll start by saying, I'm very biased, because I've created one, <laughs> but let me, um, let me just say in, 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 that, in that stem of thinking, the, when I go elsewhere, like in the next couple of weeks, I'll be in the Midwest doing a couple of different talks on behalf of Zaytuna, and every time I travel, Midwest, East Coast, wherever it is that they <laughs> I'm sent, mashallah, to speak, people have heard of the Rahma Foundation's girls model. Wherever I go, somehow they've heard of these. And it happens right here in your masjid, subhanAllah, here at MCC. Interestingly enough, is the host of um, a lot of the, girl, uh, the girls' Rahma programming. Now, interestingly enough, um, what is it that captures their attention? Because I'm always amazed how people have heard of the, our model. But what it is, and, and maybe tune in just a little bit if you're not familiar, and you can tune out if you are very familiar with it, mashallah, since many of you probably have your girls here in the model. But, and inshallah, we hope to implement something for the boys as well. But we start very, very early on. We take the girls from age four. I'll tell you the names of the groups so you can understand what we're doing here. Four and five, they're the frogs and bunnies. Think of them as the preschool group. What does frog and bunny do? In the funny puppet show and the, the Play-Doh and the, the, the reciting of Qur'an and the fun things that they're playing and all the activities, essentially think of preschool. But in addition to everything that's happening underneath, there are moral lessons being learned. Frog and Bunny are teaching moral lessons about lying, cheating, uh, uh, being good to your parents, being good to your siblings, etc. through stories between the two characters without hitting or banging the kids over the head with aqidah, 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 because that's not supposed to come till later, right? There is no discussion of hellfire and jinn and scary things, because that is not proper at that age at all. So there's age-appropriate learning. My teacher who taught me this model is really, it's amazing, it's a'anima, mashallah, but also someone who's well-versed in Western educational models. And so bring the educational models together with Islamic understanding, you have a very well thought out and created model where you're actually instilling Islam from the early, early stages, but also letting them be kids and play in the preschool model. Go to the next level, the rainbows, right? The seven, eight, and nine year olds. Here, you're talking about the seven colors of the rainbow. You're talking about all different shades and colors of the Muslim Ummah. And how even though we all are so different, we all work together to forge something beautiful. 
the rainbow, right? And so there's a very well thought out pattern of how it is they do this. And so people will say, like I was saying earlier, uh, shouldn't there be more, this is just play. No, this is not just play. This is a very specifically well thought out model of the kids to come in and they're so excited to be here. I have parents every day, or Khala Amina who's in the background here doing the coordinating of the programming. We have kids who literally, their parents drive from so far away, and when they can't come one day, or the parent is sick, or the kid is sick, or they can't come for some reason, well, luckily they tell us they are crying because they couldn't come here on Friday night to the masjid to hang out with their sisters, their young little sister friends, right, their sisterhood friends, to play and to learn about Islam. And they're singing and doing nasheed and doing crafts and all things related to this topic. Go to the next, right, the busy bees. They're learning, again, you get the point now. They're learning different models, different concepts of, uh, we lose the octagon of the beehive, right, how they are clean, and they're, well, they work together, and they produce something beautiful that smells good, the honey. Now you're starting to learn, and the girls are coming of age, and they're starting to learn how to become proper young women with proper etiquette. There are rosebuds, as, it, as you hear the term buds, right, are now starting to blossom into young girls. And all the topics that are, this is middle school, all the topics that are touchy, right, are now starting to be addressed. Boys, right, uh, hygiene issues, etc. Because you need cis girls, older girl models, to actually, uh, to actually model this for them. And then we have our high school group. The point of me telling you about this series is because what I said earlier, the girls yearn to come to the masjid, to come to this type of uh, learning. There is clear Islamic instruction happening, but there's bonds of sisterhood being formed. All while there's fun, and all while there's games, and all while there's all the rest that's happening too. Now the boy model is going to be slightly different, but the same concept is happening. It's called a mentorship model. So right now I have girls who are in as early as Rosebuds, who are now coming back, they're now in college, many of them are actually at Zaytuna, coming back and teaching the girl halakas. And I think that's beautiful, because you mentor them through, knowing that they have a shoulder and a responsibility to then come back and mentor and give back. We're hoping to do the same thing here at MCC with the boys, we're to actually have them be mentored, right, with Imam Zahir, Sheikh Rami, etc. They're going to be mentored through, have their own halakha, the way I give the girls their own halakha, then they go out and teach the younger girls. Same thing, inshallah, will happen. And I think that's, this is sort of out of the box, to be honest. Not in a lot of places have this kind of programming, but it really does bring, and I hope you'll hear from the boys, what we hear from the girls, which is that they literally will, you know, <laughs> cry and yell if they can't come here on a Friday night. So I hope, inshallah, that speaks for itself, and probably by wherever we go throughout the Bay Area and throughout the country, people are really interested in hearing about this model. So please make use of it. It's right here in your own backyard, inshallah. I have a quick, um, couple questions. Uh, I'm uh, so I grew up in a strict environment, and so that's all I know how to be. And so, and, and knowing that the strict environment didn't serve so well um, with my own kids now, I'm kind of caught in the crossfire of how much do I restrict them without them rebelling, and how much do I allow them without them succumbing to that um, and so I, I'm like confused with it because because I know myself where I grew up where I rebelled or I you know I did exactly the opposite that I was told not to do and slowly came back and now I'm you know completely different but now with my kids I worry well are they going to do the same thing because I you know if I put too much restriction like for instance um, just an example I used to listen to a lot of music, but now I don't. Um, but my kids, I know, love music, and they'll start dancing. They're all girls, and so they'll start dancing. And I'm, I'm, I'm like cringing, but I'm like, what do I do? Do I stop them because I know that trait, you know? Or do I just let them? Do I allow certain things? Do I not allow it? How do I go about setting boundaries on that? Um, and then number two, what if you have... Um, well, it's kind of the same along the line. What if you have people in your house that, you know, don't really follow the, that rule and, you know, they're like, they're completely opposite, they're okay with the music, they're okay with certain things, and you're not okay with it, and you see that the kids kind of see, okay, this parent is okay with it, and then this parent, they know that this parent isn't okay with it, so how do you strike a balance with them? Okay. 
So I, um, I taught youth group um, for a number of years and I've worked with a lot of youth um, and I get that question a lot from parents, you know, how do I strike that balance? Do I prevent them 100% from listening to music or do I let them, right, do I give them that freedom? And I think um, it's just wise for parents to be aware that we, this time that we live in, this age, this asr, is not the same as, this, as the asr that our parents or our generation was raised in. Um, I felt like, I, I feel like our parents had a lot more control um, over their kids and who their kids befriended and what their kids were exposed to, um, as opposed to our time in which social media has taken over um, and it's sort of slowly dragging them in, right, into the self-absorbed um, world where it's all about me, myself, and I, um, and about having fun and about being free and liberated, right? So if you were to prevent them 100%, um, they're going to do it anyway behind your back, right? So there has to be, you have to be able to allot some time in which they can have fun, but yet the lyrics and, and you know, and the amount of time that they spend investing um, into listening to music and how much it impacts them, that discussion really has to be had with them, right? Why uh, is music, it can be a positive force in some ways and then it can also be negative, depending on the type of music and that's a whole other discussion, right? I think every family abides by a different ruling, right? Um, but there is a lot of controversy regarding to music. But my point is that whenever I've seen that parents have completely prohibited it within the home, it was always done behind their back. And it's done to an extreme level, right, in which it just becomes an obsession because they're prevented from doing it at home. So allowing it to a certain extent within limits, it's like, okay, you have half an hour free association, you can do whatever you want, right? And hopefully they'll make good choices, and if they choose to listen to music, it within moderation, right? Um, you know, there's also... It's, you know, it's, it also depends on what their friends are doing because they don't want to be the outcast. And it's very difficult for them to feel like their friends have iPhones, their friends are on Snapchat, their friends are on Instagram and all of these things, and yet they are they have a flip phone, for example, and that's too nerdy, right? That's only for geeks. So how, how can you make them feel comfortable with being different? and showing them the beauty in being different and not having to be the same as their friends in every single aspect, right? That when they're different, they can stand out. They can set another path. They can set another example, right? And there's not much beauty if we're all the same, right? And Allah talks about the concept of ta'aruf in the Quran because he has created us differently. He has not created us to be one and the same. So teaching them that there's a lot of beauty in being different, and you have a lot to contribute um, through that, you know, diversity, and that not everything that your friends do, right, you must, you must do as well, and making them understand that everybody is out for their own self, right, at the end of the day, and their friends may not necessarily lead them to the best path, right, at the end of the day, their friends will do what is in their own benefit, um, and if you know, they, you know, they led your son or daughter towards the wrong path, they're not going to take accountability for that. So it's, it's very important to teach your child um, how to take accountability for their own actions and that they are not their friend, right? They are different. They're a different human being. Highlighting how they're different and how that's an amazing thing, right? How their differences can be beautiful. And if they were one and the same, it, there really wouldn't be much to contribute, right, if everybody was the same. And so within moderation and also going over why, how it can impact them and all the ways that it can be negative, right? And I hope that answers your question. This last question, we'll take this uh, right-hand question as the last question. It asks, 
There are families who may hesitate to bring their kids to some programs because they may not focus on traditional Islamic ways, but their kids instead may be spending time with non-Muslims or engaging in haram. And what kind of advice may we give? You know, for this, I would say it actually just um, just kind of going right to what right off of what uh, Sister Hiba here has said that what's most important is that they come to Islamic programming, right? That they come to the masjid, that they listen to the various opinions that are out there, to be honest. Now here I'm not saying expose them, to expose your children to everything that's out there. But I do think that, for example, let's use the MCC since we're sitting in it. There is definitely a board, there's definitely a group of people who are conscious about who comes into the masjid to speak, for example. And to be honest, a lot of, I haven't heard everything, obviously I haven't been to every single program here, but I have to say that the lineup of speakers and scholars and so on and invited guests from out of town and so on and so forth that have come here are typically people who are um, well respected, their opinions are moderate, etc. And I think that you can, uh, even if you don't agree with every single thing that every single speaker says, and you never will, that there is enough hate and enough good and enough foresight on the people who invited them here that their opinions are, you know, middle of the way is down, right? Your children being exposed to that is incredibly important and much more important than if it is absolutely crossing the T's and dotting the I's of every single personal belief that you hold. Because later at home, you can then bring up some things that you might have found too harsh or too problematic or too lax and then actually negotiate or discuss that maybe even negotiate, or discuss that with your children. This is, of course, the older ones who are sitting and listening and comprehending what's being said. Because they may say later, and I think this is what the worry is stemming from, they may say later, but mom, that sheikh said such and such about music. See? <laughs> and you're having a more hardliner stance on, let's say, music, since we just talked about that, than the, the person who was giving the talk. What I think is important is the negotiation that happens between you and your children. That is actually the golden, the golden key there, right there. The fact that there was a discussion and negotiation. And that is so much more powerful than keeping them away. Because you're right. You're right. They are going to turn to other outlets. They will have other channels. There's just no way around that. And those other channels, if they're not good and they're not chayyip, they will be bad and they will be haram eventually. Right, eventually. So, mashallah, bring them. Discuss with them. Talk with them. And remember that it's not all on your shoulders alone. I always say this in any parenting talk. It's not just mom and dad. There is extended family, and they play an important role. My teacher would always say, every family should have a grandmother figure. And so many of us who came here, especially our parents' generation, or maybe even grandparents, or maybe your own generation, that if you've come here from a different country where you've left behind extended family, you don't have the luxury of having grandparents here. Your children may not have that luxury. And so what she would say is, adopt a grandparent who becomes like a spiritual grandparent, meaning an auntie or uncle in the community who becomes essentially their grandparent and helps to reinforce things for you. The other thing that they would always suggest is this concept of the murabbi or the murabbiya. The key word there in the root is rabb. The person who does what? Who actually does terbiyah? Exactly, that is also the same root word. Rup, who helps in doing the terbiyah? Who helps in instilling or connecting a child to their rup, their Lord? And actually, our mentorship program I was talking about earlier with the youth groups, the the, the girls, the young ladies who run the halakas, we call them murabbiyat. Because what are they doing? They're connecting the younger girls to their rup, to their Lord. So that's the whole concept of mentorship here. One mentors another, mentors another, mentors another. So again, the whole thing here, I want to say again, the most important thing we can say about parenting is that you don't do it alone. You have the grandparent figures, right? This, even if they're spiritual grandparents, not biological grandparents. You have the murabi figures. They're like your youth group halga leaders. They're the local um, scholars that are in the community, right? Youth group leaders, etc., who actually help reinforce what it is you're teaching them at home. And that they're channels and outlets that are khair and not haram. And that's really what we're hoping to accomplish, inshallah. So well, that will end. I will say on behalf of the Khadil Center that it was an honor to be hosted here uh, at the MCC for Family Night. Inshallah, we hope to have a further working relationship with the MCC community in this Tri-Valley area. Um, I ask you all to forgive us for any mistakes we may have said and to make du'a for us. 
inshallah, for the success and growth of this wonderful, um, uh, you know, to have access to Muslim therapists and Muslim counselors is a wonderful thing, I think, Allah Adam, and that the community has truly benefited from. So I ask for your du'as and its success, and that you please um, stay in touch with us. Again, our booth is at the back. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.